in the early days of the internet, okay, not that early, uh, still now, uh, we're getting closer. There we go, that's much closer. Maybe early wasn't a good term. In the Adobe Flash era of the internet, when Flash games and animations filled the disparate threads and back alleys of the web, there was a genre of physics game called a falling sand game that took at least two or three spots on addictinggames.com. It recently re-emerged thanks to the indie game Noida, at least as far as I can tell, since they seem to have sprung up again after its release and a handful of them reference Noida directly. It actually seems to go by a lot of names, but I've always heard of it referred to as a falling sand game. I even found the original version that I played, which was very elegantly named Hell of Sand Falling. Some forum posters that Lost Media Wiki apparently tracked it down a few years ago in the internet archives. I never really knew how these games worked, but I stumbled on this really surreal, or sorry, slightly surreal YouTube channel called Toad Pond, who's made various videos about an engine they've made. This video in particular inspired me to try this, because I thought the rule system interface they made was really interesting, and in addition to that, they make tadpoles as an element. Ordinarily, these are really physics-inspired simulations that have emphasis on explosions and acids and simulate chemical reactions, which is cool, but the idea of making an ecosystem really stood out to me. I did some more research and looked at some other systems for inspiration, and found quite a few resources, including this really impressive demo channel, and the game dev talk for Noida itself. The first step was actually writing a texture to a rectangle in WebGPU, but hopefully I'll get into graphics programming in a different video. Alright, so I started with the usual, sand on a black background. It's all one color, which looks pretty plain. Sand Spiel and Sand Boxels both have shades of color for their elements. Sand Spiel in particular seems to loop colors based on the amount of granules produced or time or something similar, producing these really pretty striations. I actually got curious and looked at the code. It looks like it's a few random sources added together, one of them being a counter that increments with each program tick. I, uh, I feel like there's something else missing. Oh right, uh, there's no physics? I guess that's a little more important than the color. The game is a form of cellular automata, which is a set of basic rule sets that dictate the behavior of each granule. The most famous is generally Conway's Game of Life, which has four rules that dictate the entirety of the field's behavior. In this case, the rule set of the sand is, if there's no sand underneath, update the position. If there is, check diagonally and do the same. My actual implementation is, if there's a viable block underneath that is empty, create a new empty granule element in a sand granule element. If the block underneath is outside of bounds, a new granule is created in the place of the old one. It's devil buffered, which means that every frame, all the changes are updated on a new canvas that I just replaced the old canvas with at the end of the frame. The whole sandbox gets updated every frame by going through each granule line by line and checking its type and surroundings. Most of these choices are horribly inefficient in varying ways and get changed. I do eventually end up altering existing granules instead of creating new ones with every tick. Then I get rid of the buffer and alter the sandbox directly, which means each granule has a flag that gets toggled when it gets updated. If you don't do this, it can just be pushed along and updated several times per tick. Oh, and uh, if the rules interfere with each other, the granules just sort of disappear. I ended up with this bias, which had me confused for a little while. You might expect that I was checking the diagonals in a specific order, but I was doing it randomly. The actual cause was my update order. The granules always update from left to right. First I randomized the update for every granule every frame. I did this by taking all the granules and putting them in a list and shuffling that list. This was incredibly slow, so I threw that out and alternated the update every other line instead. Sand was mostly working, so I added an eraser and started working on adding water. It was basically just sand at first, but the sand could sink to the bottom. Then I started to add the ability for the water to disperse so it would look more like a liquid. The dispersion works by having a dispersion rate that looks forward up to that amount of pixels to see if it finds an open space. If it does, it swaps places with that granule. 
If it doesn't, it checks the opposite direction instead and does the same. If at any point it hits a wall, it'll change direction. I still think it could disperse more nicely, especially looking at the video I was basically copying from in the first place, but it, it works. Then I added some pen sizes and a wall granule. The wall element doesn't actually update at all and won't switch places with other granules. During an update tick, the wall just gets skipped over just like the empty space does. Next I wanted to add plants, so I added a seed. The seed will sprout based on its surroundings. If it's on sand or dirt, it will sprout into grass. If it's underwater and on sand or dirt, it'll sprout into kelp. I really don't like the grass, but I do like how the kelp looks. Each granule has a few variables I use for different things. They're called growth, hunger, and moisture, but I just sort of use them for whatever fits. The grass will randomly, uh, scraggle out in any up direction, turning an empty space into a grass space with a growth stat of its parent grass granule minus one. The kelp does the same, but I messed up the code, so it grows in all three directions simultaneously with a growth stat of the parent minus one. The code was so broken that it always grew out of the first granule, but it alternates back and forth with the update cycle, so you get this staggered look. I fixed the kelp and made it grow in a more complex way than the grass, mostly by accidentally making things I liked the look of. When it grows up, it has an 80% chance to grow straight up and a 10% chance to grow diagonally. The chosen direction gets put at the front of a shuffled list. If any of the above spots are kelp, it will skip its growth. It then loops through the list, and if the granule is water, it will convert it to kelp. There's a 25% chance that it will just stop there, but otherwise it will repeat the same process with other open spaces in the list. The growth stat also randomly decrements from 1 to 3 to try to prevent all of the resulting branches from terminating at exactly the same spot. I added some eggs and was going to hatch them similarly to the seeds, but I only implemented minnows. If the egg is at a certain depth, meaning there are only water or minnow tiles above it for X granules, it will hatch into a minnow. When the minnow is hatched, it gets the height of the water column above it and randomly picks a place to swim. It will then swim back and forth, changing direction if it hits anything, and if it's not at the proper height, it will have a percent chance to move up as well as the X direction it's assigned to. I made a really basic UI for this. It doesn't even support letters, because I didn't want to add them. I just have a table of pixel values for each number, and each value is either draw or don't draw. So you get one color and no background. I have a print function that will find the matching character and overwrite that texture data directly with that character's pixel array. The selection bar just tells you which element you've selected, and you can loop through on the keyboard. The functionality is mostly there to be able to click on a square, I just didn't finish it. I actually had some trouble figuring out how to structure this in Rust. I haven't had many large projects with it, so it was lost in the architecture. For example, this video uses inheritance to organize the physics interactions. I would ordinarily do the same. I could check a type and say, this inherits from liquid, so a solid type should be able to fall into it. I could try this with traits, but Traits implement functions, not variables. This means they can act a certain way, but not contain passive behavior. All of this pushes me towards implementing components, which I think Rust wants you to do anyway. A granule might just have to have a lot of component variables that contain flags and enums. I kept moving towards a full-on ECS, that's an entity component system, but that seemed like such a complicated solution to such a basic problem. Maybe I could have a vector that contains enums called components, since enums can have data passed into them and they would dictate the behavior. Data tables work for things that all of the granules share, so I could have density, temperature, is flammable, is alive, and things of that nature, but it felt so wasteful and tedious when there's overlap between types. I don't know. My solutions, or lack thereof, were quickly reaching their limits with so many bugs being added, so I would like to look at it again. It would also be nice to make a generic rule type that can be added to a granule, but I could see this being really slow if done poorly. Currently the logic is, get the relative index of a value, check its type, and if it's not x, y, or z, do this. I'm sure there's a cleaner way to handle this problem. I'm going to level with you. 
the result of it all kind of sucks. It's slow, there aren't that many interactions, and those that do exist are sort of a toss-up between feeling really cool and satisfying, or kind of grossing me out for reasons I can't explain. I spent a little less than a week on it, and it's really only an avenue to break off the rust, or um, warm up my rust abilities, and to try to make videos again. I tend to strive for really big, complete projects, and well, you can you can see how well that's gone for me. This was just meant to be a small little push to get something going. This was fun, and I have a lot more ideas and ways to improve the efficiency and code manipulability, but I'm going to end it here and probably approach it again later. I hope you found this interesting. Here's some snapshots of code progression to anyone still around.